it's ruled illegal in the European Union. The German government tried to do it and was taken to court by the European Union and lost. Why did they want to do it? Same reasons, trying to get, trying to get people to build networks um, and try to give cosy deals to people they like. There's, a, there's another aspect to this too, and that is that, um, that ADSL access is going to get more expensive under this bill. Correct. Well. No, so, that's correct, yeah. So we'll simultaneously, and, and part, part of the reason for that seems to be that that's a sweetener to make it more favourable for, for um, investment in the fibre network. Mm. So Now, I, I th the, whole, the well, whole structure of the regulation is aimed at discriminating against existing networks because if they don't, they won't get the uptake on the UFB network that will make the business cases work. So how does, how does that work in relation to the Telstra network in particular? So, the Telstra so, so what will happen is, um, uh, let's just hypothetically uh, go there. Uh, down our street in Wellington where we have cable, uh, chorus will come down and overbuild. So they'll dig a trench or they'll hang from the same power poles or other power poles fibre. They'll come into you, you're a customer of ours, they'll come into you and say, we're putting this fibre down the street, um, we'll connect it to your house for free. And you say, actually, you know, I really don't want my front yard dug up again, uh, you know, my wife's got the roses in, you know, we're all happy. They'll say, that's fine. When you do want it, it'll cost you 690 or $1,000, whatever the charge is in 10 years' time, because, you know, it's only going to be free once. Uh, and that's okay, that's your choice. And you say, oh, actually, okay, we'll put the damn thing in. Um, and oh, I might actually, uh, we're thinking about moving out, so it'll be really good to have fibre there. Um, they'll then go away, and telecom retail or somebody else will turn up and say, hey, We've got a deal for you. Um, and at the same time, not so much on our HFC network, um, we will be facing, uh, particularly it works better because uh, they will have to compete hard against us, and we will fight to the nth degree which is probably why they won't start in Wellington on our network. But if we go to another network like LLU, where, which is our network, and they do the same thing. So LLU? Um, unbundled local load. Yeah. So we've got lots of customers who have broadband and phone running over telecom copper, but it's actually our network because we've taken control of it and we pay to lease that piece of copper. So you're an unbundled local uh, customer. So. Uh, they will come in and say the same thing and they'll put fibre there. And in about two years' time, Telstra Clear will come back and say, we have to raise your prices 20%. And you'll say, well, why? And we'll say, because of the government's regulation, the average, the prices between rural and here, our prices have gone up 20%. Mm -hmm. And funnily enough, someone else will be sitting there saying, actually, I can give you broadband over fibre much cheaper. And you'll make the rational decision. Um, so again, the issue is, uh, or you say, no, I'm really happy with what I've got, and telecom come back and say, we're really sorry we've got to take the copper out because it's degraded. Or we're really sorry the exchange has fallen over and we can't, we're not going to put money into it, but there's this fibre here. Because Chorus, under this legislation, own both the copper and the fibre. So, so we've seen some pricing on this, on this, on this fibre to the home too, and that, and some leaks about it, which, which have talked about there being 10 to 30 megabits per second with a CIR, which is, seems to be some kind of minimum um, bit rate of, of 2.5 megabits per second at um, around, I don't know, 30 or $40 per month. Plus, and then we've subsequently we've seen, seen retail offerings that seem to be more like 100. Or have to be. I, I mean, the offering, let's just talk, I think, as from memory, the baseline introductory price wholesale, of course, everyone's got confused and many customers assumed that it was going to be the price they would pay. Wholesale to us would be, say, 40 bucks for a 30 megabit per second basic um, product. By the time we build the interfaces uh, and then add the CPE and then add our server, CPE. Uh, your, your modem or whatever, yeah. we either give it to you free yeah, or, we, or, or we get paid. By the time we do all that work and then by the time we provide the services, the marketing, the call centre, um, you know, the, the basic input retail price will be somewhere, I imagine, between 80 to 100, I don't know. We've been told by Crown Fibre they expect that basic wholesale price to increase over time. Uh, but the fastest speeds to come down over time. Uh, and we say, actually, we don't understand that. Why would that happen? 
We also know that the models that they're using for the business case to build this network have assumptions like 60% uptake rate. It's taken us 15 years to get 50% uptake rate in um, uh, Wellington and Christchurch. So to make the models work, the prices will have to go up. Um, what they've also told us, those prices are under cost. It's costing the LFCs more to provide that service than they're getting back. So that's not going to last very long. You know, so none of this, none of this, gravity will always work. Economics will always work. Uh, and the only way to ensure that customers will have a fair go is that they have a chance to make choices about network and infrastructure, how they want their broadband, who to go to, uh, and, and buy top. Uh, and, and that's our main issue, um, is provide a, a regulation that will ensure, comp you know, the Commerce Commission came out last week and said, competition's alive and well in New Zealand, telco land, great. It's not going to be if this continues in the next, you know, uh, five to 10 years. This, I mean, when I've been thinking about this for the last, last few weeks I've, and reading other people's comments about it, I mean, Internet New Zealand have come out quite critically of it, and they've said that, yes, this was an upside in the sense that there might be some slightly faster internet, but the downside that Vikram Kumar in particular was pointing to was saying that, that over time it's going to get, um, it's likely to stay, stay very expensive and possibly get more expensive and Correct. not necessarily get a lot faster. Correct. And what strikes me about this is that right at the moment we already have speeds available which are very similar to what they're talking about. Um, and in Australia those, those speeds are sort of fairly commonplace. And they're cheaper than the pricing that, we're being, that, we're, we, that, is, that is being proposed for us here. So we're sort of thinking, okay, we're going to move to an era, era where we have one provider, the cost is going to be more expensive there's going not going to be any, and there's not going to be any change over time. Yeah. So again, it comes back to my point. New Zealand's a small place. It is geographically challenging for any network builder, whether it be mobile or fixed wiring. Um, you have pockets of demand, both behaviourally and in terms of population base across the whole country, very different. Let the networks, let the market work, and let it fight it out. And people who, when the demand for fibre and those speeds gets to such a degree, people will build it out. And I'm not talking about the farming area, I think that needed the intervention. Uh, and, and let's not forget that people want to be mobile. So 3G now is pretty fast, but LTE will be, people will argue, you know, will be the equivalent speed, probably 30 megabits or faster, depending on... But LTE the, being 4G? Yeah, being 4 they call it, I get confused, that I call it. But they're talking about 5G too in the States at the moment. Yeah, right? and that's why I think you've seen Obama say we're not going to put any more fibre on the ground or government help them to, we will, we will go more mobile. Um, so our view is where you get cheaper prices, you get cheaper prices with networks who have been in the ground a long time, who have been utilised fully, um, the companies who have made the initial investment have their return up front are beginning to price differently. Um, so, and again, the issue is who's going to use it and for what. Um, the applications that need those types of speed in a normal household will come one day, evidently, mm. and they will come. Um, we've seen some indications providing uh, big pipes to certain organisations such as universities and others where you would think they would be filled up immediately where they're still not being used at one tenth of capacity mm -hmm. uh, and you'd think scientists would chuck everything down and they're not. I'm sure one day it will happen but being ahead of the demand curve uh, is very expensive and very disruptive for customers. Um, so what we would say if customers want the best chance of being able to get the best prices and the best speeds then maximise the number of infrastructures you have around, maximise the number of retail service providers you have on those infrastructures, and you're away. Or do you also want to but that will innovation in the, in the Correct, delivery of but that will kill the economics of a national network being built by one player. That won't work for them, because they will not get enough customers on to make the business case work. So another way of putting this, is the preoccupation with fibre to the home actually one of the fundamental flaws in all of this? I mean, is Oh, absolutely, and it's purely a political motivation because it's a trendy thing to do and evidently it will change our GDP magnificently 
and increase productivity, and I've probably allowed a bit of sarcasm to come in my mm. voice then. Um, but, you know, the, the thing that labelled me in those days before two ends joined us, and will no doubt leave us again and agree, a Luddite was when I said there is no empirical evidence showing productivity increases because of ultra-fast broadband. Now, just, now, I don't really want to go into that argument because there is evidence of pockets where people use it. Uh, but if you want the use of pornography, uh, gaming, emails and movies, that's what that you will get. Mm. So from a political argument, now politics is very different to reality. So I acknowledge that the government has every right to set a policy aim um, and to do it. I just find it difficult to accept that it turns its back on 20 years of investment by a number of companies trying to get competition here and says that investment is not important, nor are they important. Does nor should we consult with them or talk with them. We should just do this. Yes, which, which, yeah. which Stephen Joyce did last week. Recently. Again, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, there's, there's an irony in this too, in the sense that um, Telecom initially didn't participate in the UFB proposal plan either, because they also didn't want to do structural separation initially, or they thought it was impossible. And they also felt very strongly that what they wanted to build was fibre to the node, which seems to be quite similar to the HMC sort of type thing. I mean, they, they in fact already built that, and they then wanted from from so so build fibre into communities, but then have have um, other methods of getting from whatever your your fibre termination point to the house the house, which are more sort of cost effective. Um, yeah, well, again, I think just to just to make that very clear, um, the way networks work, of course, is you have an exchange, whether it be a fibre exchange or a copper one. The nodes are effectively the big cabinets you see in people's streets and suburbs. Uh, uh, and then, of course, you have the last mile to the, the homes. Uh, Telecom had already done a substantial build to the node in preparation for both um, ADSL and VDSL um, from cabinets. Uh, and Paul Reynolds said a few weeks ago he's built out now 86% of his network to the node. That means that's a done deal now because um, anyone who tries to, if the government said, no, we're not going to give you the deal, it's very simple for him to connect every house and say, come, come along and compete against me, you're too late. Um, and, you know, two years ago, Telecom had the choice to say to the government, we'll do our own thing, thank you, and the government's crown, the government's UFB network would have fallen over because Telecom would have been there before anyone else had a chance. Instead, they've decided to cooperate, which, you know, that's their choice and I can understand. Um, but today what it means is that effectively, um, in my belief, Telecom is out the hand in these negotiations. They're sitting there with most of the investment made. Uh, they might argue slightly differently that the last mile costs a lot of money, and it does. Um, but they have every, every node fibre, you know, so they can choose to provide VDSL down copper to people's homes, or they can build out the copper to people's homes. So, uh, you know, it's been a very difficult journey for telecom. Uh, things governments have done to them over the last few years have been unconscionable. They've destroyed private property rights in them. Well, way, way beyond anything we asked for in terms of gaining access. Um, you know, they had to secure some type of um, shareholder return somehow, uh, and they've chosen to choose this way. I'd say what I said publicly last week, if Mr Reynolds pulls this deal off, uh, I take my hat off to him. He has, he will reinstate the telecom monopoly with government money and government protection. And that's one hell of a deal, and he's a better man than I. Uh, and uh, I am very impressed if he can do it. Which, 